güzel konuşuldu diye düşünüyorum. Ya güzeldi güzel bir. <gülüyor> İyi ki baya, baya iyi bir sempozyum. Yani her konuşma benim ilgimi çekmedi o başka ama yani şey olarak evet. sempozyum bir bütün olarak iyi gidiyor yani. Evet onu da öyle. <gülüyor> Fashion atlet. <gülüyor> Sıcak abi burası biraz. Güzel tabii evet. <gülüyor> Selam. Yürü yürü. Yok şimdi biz bizeyiz. Deniz nasılsın? Geçmiş Yok. olsun. Geçmiş olsun. Eyvallah. Barış, yani ayrıldı şimdi gelecek ama yok adam 20 evet. dakika nefes alsın yani <gülüyor> en çok onlar yoruldu aslında aramızda
direct uh, connection with life itself. So in order to discover this relation, we are going to talk about his critical um, point. It is the in, uh, drawing on the Foucault's recent work on ethics. I will take up the concept of problematization. And finally, as an, uh, how uh, pro problematization works, I refer to Foucault's analysis of the practice of paresia, the practice of telling the truth in his last lectures, which had a very important role in ancient Greek culture. So, based on these lectures, Foucault says that he has examined his story, but they are not historian. He is not historian. It, it, it, he describes them as a philosophical exercise. So, to understand what Foucault means by this, I would like to consider another phrase he uses to describe his work: history of the now and histories of the now. So, these works are also defined as histories of the now. So what does it mean to write a history of the present, writing a history of the present? So perhaps we should ask question, what does it mean to write history of the present now, in the present? First of all, it means revealing that there's a history of any human experience or practice that determines the way we exist, think and act. So revealing this historicity means that the appeal to history functions as a critical undertaking. Indeed, the thing here actually is just as the things which determines our life, this is natural or um, the things which are obligatory and because they, they, they, have, they are the product of the historical conditions and so to reveal it actually here is important. So writing the history of the present also means in this framework, acting from certain problems, problems of the present. So therefore, it starts with a question as to now and turns to history based on this current problem. Thus, writing the history of the present involves a diagnosis of the present, present writing the history of the present means that. So according to Foucault, philosophical theories are also a toolbox of conceptual tools that we can use when working on specific problems that we can use for solving these problems. It's a toolbox. So here, this approach, which approaches the past from the present and sees the history of philosophy as a productive resource that can be used to understand and respond to current problems, of course has faced some significant criticism at this point, I would like to refer to another important concept of his thought, the concept of problematization, such approach. In fact, I would like to say that I will talk about problematization more. This approach, in fact, establishes a dynamic link between philosophy and its own history and brings the past and the present together on the ground of critical activity of thought. So now, how that can happen? Problematization is, I would like to talk about what would, do we mean, and what does it mean? So he describes the concept of problematization as a response to a real concrete situation. So problematization practice should seek to seek a historical study that was turn like that why and how did experiences and practices that were up to a certain point taken for granted and need not to be discussed become a problem at a certain moment in history? Now I'm going to talk about this in a moment, which is the expression of truth telling in ancient Greece of Pisat, Paresia pre practice. I will discuss why and how the practice of art was problematized at a certain moment in history. For that reason, we will uh, talk about this concept more Then we will give some examples about that. So problematization is the expression of the critical activity of thought because here the person 
While doing that, distances himself from the given and makes it his own object of thought or her. In this way, it questions both its possible conditions and its aims and enables us to see that, in fact, these are the solutions offered in response to a concrete situation at a certain moment in history. It is one of the possible answers that can be given in these circumstances. If we accept them without question today, without any questioning, it is because these answers have been solidified and become absolute. And the job of thought is to identify such situations and turn them into a problematization immediately. Thus, thought also begins to develop the conditions for different responses to the situation in question. It can re-evaluate old practices, explore whether they can take on a new meaning that's still valid in the present, or and create new practices and new types of relationships from here. Thus, it can give a new form to the world we live in. Therefore, recognizing the contingency of what seems necessary offers us a significant opportunity the opportunity to intervene in these practices and transform ourselves and the world we live in. So this is actually this opportunity and this way of working to question and problematize ourselves and our practices and our actuality and its transformation is actually an attitude we adapt towards ourselves and the world, a philosophical ethos, we, he defines it. So now, the thing I want to emphasize is that the history of philosophy, to make the history of philosophy, to provide the resources that philosophy needs to function as a critical and transformative practice in this direction. So history of philosophy provides that. Considering the relationship between philosophy and its history in this way, the purpose of writing the history of the present in applied practice can show us that there is a specific historical analysis richness. So what does it mean? I to understand it more, I would like to give examples of Foucault's handling the issue of truth. So because the question of truth is a current issue in our time. The question of truth can be addressed in the context of an investigation of the conditions they make that make true knowledge possible, but the way of dealing with this problem in the project of writing the history of the present will, in contrast, take the form of engaging in the history of truth. Or thus, this fundamental issue is explored in a variety of problems throughout Foucault's inter intellectual career. Truth has a history. That's why truth is produced in history and the production of truth is closely linked to power relations. To show this for Foucault, to show it is to engage in the political history of truth. Foucault also tried to reveal the knowledge and truth that are not independent of power and that is no poor reason as subjectivity that's outside or prior to these relations. And he revealed it or by Embarking on the political history of truth in his studies, he analyzes modern institutions and certain institutional practices. So the truth is actually also can be, uh, the, it's possible to consider the issue of truth in terms of different relations that subjects have established with themselves throughout history. Therefore, it is a problem, it can be considered as a problem of relations between subjectivity and truth. This is what Foucault does is he, in his recent work focusing on, on ancient Greece. These works in which the person focuses on transformations that they perform by applying certain techniques on themselves or also the history of truth examined on the ethical plane. We actually examine, uh, maybe we can see it like that. Here, the history of truth also becomes the history of subjectivity. Thus, ancient Greek philosophy becomes an important source that feeds Foucault's thoughts on the issue of truth. And so, in addition to that, on the other hand, 
Foucault studies on the relations between subjectivity and truth in ancient Greece also revealed that it is also possible to approach the problem of truth in terms of telling the truth and telling it. Because in this philosophy, in ancient Greek philosophy, we also see that such questions are asked. Who can say the truth? What is the importance of telling the truth? Or on what subject should be the truth be told mainly? About the nature or about human? What are the consequences of telling the truth? And what is the relation of truth to power? These are philosophical problems around which philosophies were formed in ancient Greece. And in his lectures on Paresia that Foucault examines, Foucault presents Socrates' philosophy as a philosophy shaped around these questions. Now I would like to examine, uh, I would like to move from this example, how problematization works through this example. So let's talk about Paresia a bit. What does it mean in this culture? What did it mean? Paresia means telling the truth, but how it functions? It is actually to criticize the adversary by revealing the truth that one believes to be true. It is an act of courage because it may, it may face a negative reaction or be punished for the truth he has spoken. This practice appears in the field of politics in ancient Greece. This practice actually as a necessary practice for the proper functioning of Athenian democracy, because democracy gives every citizen the right to have an equal say in parliament on public issues. In fact, everyone has the right their opinion to express their op opinion doesn't mean that everyone will tell the truth. Therefore, the paresiastes, the one which uses, who uses paresiastes is the person who comes forward and presents to the assembly what he believes to be true. Thus, it presents the difference peculiar to democratic equality. Say, telling the truth is not something belongs to everyone. The one who comes forward and presents it to the assembly is the one. However, in parallel with the crisis of democratic institutions, a crisis situation arises regarding the practice of paresia, the relationship between truth-telling and legal regulations in the field of politics has started to pose a problem. And because while every citizen has the right to speak, there's a legal guarantee that one can express his or her opinion, but who must speak the truth is not regulated by law. Also, there is no law that can protect the truth-teller from any negative behavior or punishment that he or she may be subjected to. In this case, the who the parias says this is become, becomes problematic. On the other hand, the function of parisia has also gained a problematic quality. This is related to the fact that people who use parisia negatively find their place in the parliament. Democracy is now accused of giving equal space to all forms of paresia, as it allows every word to be heard, even to the worst. And the purpose of the person who uses paresia negatively is to say only what the majority wants to hear. It's about appealing to their emotions, and it's not about voicing what he or she truly believes to be true or not offering criticism to the interlocutors. And in any case, those in the parliament only allow things that are in line with their own views to be expressed and do not want other opinions, different ones, to be heard. Therefore, the assembly ceases to be the place for criticism brought through the discourse of the truth. Thus, it began to be questioned whether Paris itself was really sufficient to reveal the truth. And this questioning went along with the criticisms of the democracy. So here we see that Paris becomes a problem and various relations related to it are problematized and new questions are, are started to be asked about them, like the relationship between truth and democracy. And so in the face of democracies, 
it transforming into a form of government where Parisia can no longer find a place in the positive sense, Socrates considers Parisia as uh, defines Parisia as truth and bias redefined on the basis of relationship. It is no longer a practice directly applied in the field of politics and it turns into an ethical philosophical practice. Now Parisia's purpose is to provide individuals the a good life they need the they need the ethos for to gain they need for ethos to gain in other words to gain uh, the way of being and behaving necessary for them to lead the right life but this does, doesn't mean that parisia no longer has any ties to politics because polit philosophical parisia by interfering with the souls of the citizens who will participate in the political field enables them to govern themselves through truth and thus become subjects who listen and speak the truth. Therefore, thanks to the definition of Parisia in the field of ethics and gaining a philosophical character, it is possible for a truth to have a critical function in the field of politics. With this uh, thing, and the prominence of the relationship between truth and life in practice of telling the truth is at the same time closely related to what was understood from philosophy at that time. Foucault also emphasizes this in, the, in his lectures. He says that philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy is generally accepted the idea in historiography in which the commanding thyself is at the root of the issue of relations between the subject and truth. But in the, by analyzing the philosophical text of ancient Greece, Foucault wants to show that another principle, the principle of self-concern, lies on the basis of both this relationship and philosophical reflection in general. Knowing thyself or self-concern also emerges and gains meaning with the framework of this principle. So this definition now leads to an important view on what is understood from philosophy in ancient Greece. If we use the expression used by Hadot regarding ancient Greek philosophy, an important um, uh, definition we can say, according to Foucault, in ancient Greece, philosophy aimed to shape the person rather than inform. It is a practice of self-concern. Philosophy as uh, the concern of being self thinks about the relation between the truth and subject in the following way. Subject cannot access truth as it is. In order to access uh, truth, it should make some transformation over itself, over its way of existence. And this self-transformation process is described by Foucault as spirituality. And he thinks that the relation with the, between philosophy and spirituality is disconnectable in uh, the ancient age. And what we can call the concern of being self is not only about the body of knowledge, it should have a transformative effect. It's in way of existing. The individual should work on itself in order to create a self-concern. And truth of philosophy in this way is ethical. And it is characterized by the aptitude uh, between the discourse and actions of an individual. It shows us uh, that the philosophy understood as a way of living in ancient Greece. This is what Foucault wants to show us. And in this way, Socrates is uh, both a philosopher and a paresiestas. And what makes him both a philosopher and paresiestas is not that he produced a philosophy about world, but it is the harmony between his discourse and his way of life. Socrates acted in compliance with his own threat. He always was interested in his, himself, and he always tried to encourage the others to have concerns about oneself. Uh, Therefore, what we see here is actually truth, why truth should be said. Importance of telling the truth. 
who can tell or say the truth. This can be other problematizations. And this is actually what Socrates did uh, to get in connection with truth through, through these um, questions, to know and say truth creates a critical and transformative relation between the subject and the others. And to be able to construct it ethically can contribute to the political arrangements. Of course, Foucault's ideas and investigations about the relation between the self and truth in ancient philosophy has repercussions, repercussions in uh, today's uh, philosophical practice. Today, philosophy is not such a practice. With Descartes, he says that it is uh, the beginning of the modern age of the history of truth. And truth is uh, seen as a method of knowledge, as a method to use the right method. And the relation between subject and reality had changed to and the subject is seen as an entity which can access truth only through knowing. And according to Descartes, this subject is independent from, actually Descartes suggests as a scientific method which is independent from the individual's sub, uh, mor moral existence. In order to access truth, one does not need to go through ethical transformations, according to Foucault, Descartes had equipped philosophy with the principle of getting beyond the knowing subject and disrupted the relation between the philosophy and self. And so the self-concern self had been excluded from the philosophical domain. According to Foucault, this attitude should be made actual as a critical attitude and it can be seen as a kind of functionalizing such an attitude beginning from this framework the way to approach to history of philosophy as a history of problems can open up some opportunities the thing which i mentioned in the beginning what can, how it can be possible to forge a relationship between us and the world in which we live. Actually, it's not about looking for the solutions of the actual problems in past philosophies or to ask for solutions. What's important is to forge a dynamic link between philosophy and history and to bring together either side over the ground of the activity of the thought. Of course, to understand now, we need history. We need philosophy of history in order that we can understand today philosophically. So history of philosophy and the historical material obtained from this research can help us to understand the experiences which determined us. It can help us deepen or understand what we have brought so far, or it can provide us with conceptual tools which can allow this. Also, it allows us a certain way of relation between ourselves, uh, between the world and with ourselves. Because in order that an individual can take a distance towards himself or herself and the world, one needs to think on history. And thanks to this distance, any possibility opens up. Only thanks to distance, we can be critical towards the thoughts and ideas which had been submitted as obligations or as musts. And this uh, will help us uh, to strip these thoughts from explicitness. So such a way of thought opens up possibilities for transformation of this thought. Of course, this uh, applies to the past. 
what we at stake is to bring together past and today around a common problematization because it might be possible to have a different perspective towards past. For example, the role of self-concern uh, in ancient philosophy might be helpful, which actually might be very instrumental in terms of revealing various possibilities in the history of philosophy. In conclusion, let me end with what I have said in the beginning. The interest in history of philosophy shouldn't be only diving in the history and reflecting today's opinion over past. We can see it as a philosophical exercise, as Foucault suggested, and it can be an ascesis, a work on oneself, which happens through thought. So it can be a practice which is emancipating thought. What I want to emphasize here is this critical attitude. History of philosophy should allow the individual uh, opportunity for transformation over oneself and over the history. And because uh, Parisian analysis show us that such an attitude entails uh, such a relation between truth and ethics. These analyses are quite important in terms of understanding our actuality, uh, who, because these questions are still important today. Who can tell the truth? Why is it important to tell the truth? Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you, Didai Deniz Altınkaya. She discussed on philosophy and spirituality. If you have any questions for the speakers, we will take and go together. At the end, now I'd like to announce Sarah Atten, and she will be speaking in English. That's why I am switching to English. Professor Sarah Atten, Kadınlar ve Felsefe İlişkisi'ne dair bir sunum yapacak. Kadınlar ve Felsefe Tarihi inceleme ve sorunlar. Kendisi York Üniversitesi Felsefe Profesörü, 17. yüzyılda Britanya Felsefesi ve bir kadın filozof Anne Conway gibi eserlerin yazarı. Aynı zamanda Cambridge Platoncular ve kadın filozoflar hakkında birçok derleme ve makale yazmıştır. Bunun yanında Profesör Atın Uluslararası Fikirler Tarihi Arşivi adlı kitap dizisinin yöneticiliğini yapmaktadır. Sayın Atın konuşmasına felsefe tarihçiliğinde kadın filozoflara yönelik giderek artan ilginin etkileri ve daha kapsayıcı bir felsefe tarihine yönelik kazanımlardan bahsedecek. Umuyoruz teknik meseleleri çözdük ve bizi duyabiliyorsunuz Profesör Atın. Söz sizin efendim. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. I can't hear you. Oh. We hear you now. Good. Um, first of all, my apologies about the technical problems. And my apologies to the, the last speaker for having interrupted her schedule as well. But I hope now these problems are, are, are solved and that you can at least hear me uh, um, clearly. I did have a screen to share, but unfortunately the button has disappeared. So I will be giving this paper without any um, PowerPoints. I have probably got more to say than um, there is time, so I will have to compress what I have to say. Uh, please forgive me for that. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the, uh, I'm going to reflect really on, on the work that I've been involved with on recovering women philosophers and to make a case for the fact that it's certain approaches to history that have been critical for this. Um, and time allowing, I would like to, to, to um, 
also say a few things about how I think this can take us forward and um, reflect a bit on some of the some of the um, uh, implications for how we think about the philosophical canon. So um, until recently, the fate of women has been in philosophy, in, in the history of philosophy has been amnesia uh, on the part of philosophers and historians alike. Um, the, um, the, uh, this was the case even where women have, have been at the forefront of, of philosophy. Um, I work on the early modern period. The um, uh, his, ordinate, normal historic histories of philosophy will not tell you that the first defense of Locke was by a woman. They do not tell you that how, how women were very much interested in new philosophy uh, of the time. Um, uh, uh, I had this on a PowerPoint. I can't, I'll skip all the detail, but we can come back to that in, in, in time. Um, but basically the point is that if you look for um, a look at received history of, of philosophy, you will find no indication of how receptive women were to new philosophy. And, um, but this situation is changing. There is now increasing amount of work being done on women whose philosophy has been restored and there's lots of work going on to discover more. Scholars are now engaged in search and find missions across the time spectrum from antiquity to the 20th century. There's work going on on women Pythagoreans, on 18th century political philosophers, like the work that Sandrine Belsch does, um, on 19th century philosophers and on 20th century philosophers. Books and articles are being written about them to study their philosophy, to understand their interests and to, um, to understand their priorities and to trace their legacies. In fact, there are even courses now on lots of university curricula with women included. But um, nevertheless, the history of women philosophers is still a fragmented history. And the place of women philosophers in standard narratives is uncertain and insecure. The philosophers so far recovered are in fact just a few We've made a start, but there's much more to do. Um, so I want to hear in this talk, say something about this work that's been done to restore them and at some of the ch challenges which we've had to face in so doing. I think the first point to make is that the recovery of women philosophers owes a lot to think, um, forces outside philosophy principally the upsurge of interest in women's history spearheaded by the women's movement. However, this wasn't enough by itself to generate an interest in philosophy and women philosophers. And the feminist um, theorists who emerged from this period, late 20th century, um, themselves were not interested in women philosophers, uh, except insofar as they were feminists and they, they, they had a very limited view in those days of what constituted a fem as a, a feminist. Um, for the most part, feminists of that time focused on exclusion of women and sought to theorize it. Um, even going so far as to say that philosophy itself is misogynistic. Now, the reco successful recovery of women philosophers, on the other hand, came from historians of philosophy and was in large part owing to an approach to history of philosophy, which they adopted. Um, obviously, they didn't adopt the kind of approach which I've referred to earlier that prevailed at that time in Britain and North America, which was not hospitable to the contribution of women. But the most important thing was they focused inquiries not on women's exclusion from philosophy, but women's achievements in philosophy. Crucially, they asked different questions uh, especially what philosophy did women produce and how did they manage to achieve it? Answering those questions involved not merely tackling the texts that were available and analyzing the arguments of women or what were taken to be their arguments, but it also involved paying attention to the context in which they philosophized, to the philosophical and social circumstances in which they, they philosophized. 
And this pr approach is premised on the recognition that to discover women's philosophy and to understand their arguments, it's essential to understand the historical conditions in which they worked. And this meant finding out about their intellectual milieu. And to do that meant learning about the neglected philosophers of the past, and that includes men as well as women. Um, the, the philosophers, in other words, who have been overshadowed by the canonical greats of today. And it required rediscovering what philosophy was understood to be at different times. That philosophy was not always the same as we understand it now. Um, and that, so that to do that involved historical distancing, dispensing with our contemporary notions um, about who, who was important in philosophy and setting aside contemporary conceptions of philosophy itself. And I think the value of this approach is to be measured in the number of philosophers that we can now able to, to discuss, women philosophers, that is. Of course, women's achievements in philosophy cannot ignore exclusion. And uh, of course, educational disadvantage, social prejudice, cultural expectations and other impediments to philosophy um, uh, are, are, are, are problems which all women philosophers have faced. Opportunities to philosophize were more difficult for a woman because of those, those, those circumstances. And for the vast majority of women, to be able to philosoph philosophize meant overcoming deep-seated customs and prejudices about women's capabilities. Um, to be able to philosophize meant being free to exercise um, uh, one's mind. And in earlier times, women were not always free to philosophize under the same conditions as men. Um, so, uh, and the, um, the, the circumstances in which women philosophized are only apparent when we pay attention to the context in which she and other female philosophers practice philosophy. Well, there were, of course, women who, uh, um, who did manage to philosophize. One of them was Anne Conway, on whom I've written, and another was uh, uh, uh, an Italian, Eleonora Piscopia, um, who actually uh, was able to study philosophy at the uh, University of, of Padua. Um, Anne Conway was able to study philosophy with a, a teacher from Cambridge, although she didn't attend the university. But um, it's, it's very telling that, um, in fact, Eleonora was the last person, last woman to be awarded a degree at, in philosophy at, at Padua for many centuries. Um, the, the, the chance for doing this was discontinued after she graduated. And, and the philosophy of Anne Conway was uh, only published after she died and anonymously. Well, so what has this all got to do with philosophy, one might ask. After all, knowing about the social and cultural conditions under which women philosophized merely explains why there, are, there were so few women who did, did philosophy or why we haven't heard of them. But there is a philosophical point, and it is that the historical conditions under which women have practiced impact directly on their philosophy at the hermeneutic level. Knowledge of those conditions is fundamental for understanding their philosophy. And it helps us to understand not just the themes which they discussed and the arguments which they used, but why their philosophy took the form it did and why they philosophized in the way they did. In short, it's crucial for understanding their thought. And furthermore, a better understanding of historical context is crucial for addressing a major problem to be faced when recovering unfamiliar philosophers, that is their very unfamiliarity, the alterity, if you like. So I'll just say a little bit more about that. Um, the problem of, of alterity um, or unfamiliarity in the thought of women from the past is, is, is a major challenge. Where their writings survive, it's not always easy to make sense of them. Um, this, of course, most often arises in the case of non-canonical non philosophers because they are by definition less familiar to us. With women philosophers, the problem is made more challenging because for most of history, they've been forgotten. 
In consequence, there is no history of interpreting them, and we have lost touch with the philosophical traditions within which they practiced philosophy. We cannot study philosophers, those philosophers, simply by interpreting them as if they were part of the dominant philosophical traditions of the present. An essential prerequisite to understanding their philosophy and understanding its relevance to us now is we need to is that we need to find a way to understand them in their own terms. And this points to the importance of um, context and the usefulness of the lessons of history. Now, um, related to this is, is a problem which, about which Sandrine Bersch talked this morning, um, uh, at least it was this morning in, in London, uh, a different time for you in Turkey. Um, Women of the past have not always used standard means of philosophizing. Their, their, their, their, their philosophical thoughts often appear in unfamiliar um, genres like, um, um, like philosophical maxims or, or um, um, another source is, is letters. One of the most famous uh, philosophical sets of philosophical letters are the letters exchanged between Descartes and Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Uh, and um, there are many others I had, um, but I, um, I'll just, for reasons of time, just not li list um, some examples. Um, the problem with letters is that they tend to only give us a, a glimpse of what these women have thought. Uh, have thought. I mean, it's just a, a, a partial uh, um, record of, of, of what their um, philosophical views were. Of course, alterity, that is unfamiliarity, is not the whole problem. In fact, a lack of familiarity will be less of a problem as we gradually come to, to um, uh, we study these, these figures and, and become used to the way they, they wrote and how they philosophized. Um, but nevertheless, the fact remains that in most cases, women recovering women's philosophy is, is going to be very difficult because in many cases we don't have large bodies of writing. Um, the correspondences are incomplete in most cases and um, as I said they only constitute part of the philosophical output. There are many reasons for this um, uh, which we can perhaps discuss um, but it, it, the fact remains is that sometimes the only evidence we have that women philosophized comes indirectly from other writings. For instance, the Italian Countess Aurelia d'Este, Duchess of Lim Limatola, is known to have studied Cartesianism, but the only writings we have are philosophical sonnets, uh, poems, which she wrote. Um, another Italian, Eleonora Barba Piccola, translated Descartes into Italian, and the preface shows that she, she, um, she was very, uh, she, she was very um, deeply uh, read in, in Cartesianism, but we don't have any other writings to, to, to judge her philosophy from. And then, of course, there are all the women whose, um, whose philosophical le legacy is beyond retrieval because their writings have simply been lost. Sometimes the only evidence we have that they existed are, are histories, such as Gilles Menage's um, History of Women Philosophers, which is really just a, a list of, um, it's largely just a list of names. But these kind of histories, there aren't many of them, but they do at least do the, do, do the, do us the um, credit, do, do these, these women the credit of acknowledging that they existed and they were philosophers. However, just knowing names does little to change the discouraging fact that the philosophy of many women maybe most women philosophers will never be recovered because their thought um, was never recorded or to be lost. Such women are, as it were, philosophical blanks. Nevertheless, I would argue that even knowing their names is important. Even if many women of the past are just names, um, the fact that we know their names testifies that, that they existed, it testifies to the fact that there have been women who use their minds. And um, this is important because it challenges long-standing misogynistic prejudices, which can be found in all periods of history. 
the prejudice that women didn't do philosophy, that women didn't have the brains to do philosophy, or that those who did were exceptional for their sex. So knowing the names of female philosophers who once existed will make a difference to perceptions about women and how we think about them. Another problem about recovering women is again another one which Sandrine touched on in her paper this morning that um, is that many women have uh, the, it, the, the work of many women has not been credited to them. A modern example is uh, has recently been revealed is that Susan T Sontag was obliged to cede authorship of her, her book on Freud to her husband and um, under whose name it was published and this happens with other women. But worse than that, there are many women who've been, who've been written off as either hysterics or mad, as in the case of Anne Conway or Margaret Cavendish, or um, Emily du Châtelet, who's only remembered as Voltaire's lover and not for the mind, her mind. And there are terms like um, mystic or um, learned lady, um, even uh, which, which obscure the fact that the woman in question had philosophical ideas. Um, many novelists, the women are known better as novelists uh, than as philosophers. Um, and um, George Eliot is, a, is an example. And another uh, touched on by Sandrine is that some feminist philosophers have only been recognized as such, as philosophers that is very recently uh, Mary Wilsoncroft is the example that she used. Um, so the task of recovering women philosophers has not been easy. Um, there have been many challenges. Um, recognizing and facing up to those challenges has been instrumental in advancing the recovery of um, uh, the recovery project of women's philosophy in Europe. And the contextual approach taken has proven valuable for dealing with the philosophy of the forgotten philosophers of Europe. But strangeness and difference are not just features of women from North America and Europe, but of women who philosophized in entirely different traditions, in different cultures and different societies across the globe. So putting history back into the history of philosophy by adopting contextual approaches and thereby recognizing alterity in the history of philosophy. This approach, which has proved um, so beneficial for the recovery of the study of women of the past can be applied elsewhere. And it's particularly valuable in the case of thinkers whose circumstances and concerns are remote from our own. And it holds out the prospect for further work in hitherto uncharted territory the, the, the, of the women philosophers beyond Europe and North America, for the recovery of women philosophers in Turkey, in India, China, Africa, South America, everywhere else in the world. Well, it's one thing to recover women philosophers, but what should we do with them? when we found them. How do we make women's oh, contribution? Biz kadınları. How do we make women's contribution part of the general philosophical conversation? Well, the challenge for us now is to include women in the general narrative of the history of philosophy. And this is a complex issue. I don't have time to deal with it now, but I'll just um, I'll just I'll just say a, a, a few things without attempting to integrate with what I've just been saying, um, particularly in this question of um, how to fit women into the so-called philosophy canon. Well, the first thing I would say is it's important to keep in mind that the history of philosophy and the so-called canon are two different things. Um, there is no fixed canon. The canon is, is the selection of, the, of, of those you value, uh, especially for teaching purposes. And the teaching canon is a, is, a, is a syllabus. Nevertheless, it does Im impact on how we um, think about uh, the history of philosophy. Um, and fitting women into that pre-existing can canon is a contradiction from the outset since that canon was formed without taking 
account of philosophy by women. One answer that has been suggested is that there should be a canon made up only of women. I think there are problems about this, we can perhaps discuss in the discussion period, but um, not least that we don't have very many women to make up the canon, and so this would be a kind of canon of the folk demure, as it were. Um, it wouldn't be really a representative of the range of women's thought. Um, and also to treat women's philosophy as a separate philosophical sphere brings a danger of sidelining it, as happened in the case of feminist philosophy, which is largely taught outside philosophy departments. It also carries the danger of downgrading women's philosophy, women thinkers by inventing a kind of woman's page in philosophy with women's philosophy as an optional extra or gender curiosity. Were that to happen, it would take women's philosophy back down the one-way street of forgetting. Well, slotting women into the existing canon is, as I said, not the answer um, for the reasons I've already given. But I'll just illustrate this with the example very, very briefly, uh, with the example of the English philosopher Damaris Masham. Um, she was the daughter of the Cambridge Platonist Ralph Cudworth and a very close friend of John Locke. She wrote two short, she actually published two, two small books, um, a discourse with very religious sounding titles, a discourse concerning the love of God and occasional thoughts in reference to the, to the Christian life. Well, when you look at these books, it is clear that um, she had much in common with Locke. Um, unfortunately, I was going to show you some extracts, but, but that won't be possible because the screen share isn't working. But so you'll just have to take my word for it that um, she does, um, she, th there are plenty of echoes of, for Locke, for, of Locke in these writings. And so this would suggest the obvious thing to do with Damaris Masham is to slot her into the famous empiricist rationalist canon alongside Locke. Um, but in fact, her, her, um, her writing also has echoes which recall the philosophy of her father, Ralph Cudworth, who's not a, com not a canonical philosopher and normally regarded as the antithesis of Locke. So if we try to place Damaris by reference to the received story, which still tend, um, the, the, um, this, this, she seems to be an anomaly because there are both Cudworthian and Lockean elements here. But why should we assume that this, is the tra that, that this traditional story is correct? Damaris Masham and Cudworth, um, the, the, the comparative analysis shows that there is much common ground between Damaris Masham and, and both Cudworth and Locke, but it also, one can argue, is ground that both these philosophers share. In other words, there's more in common between the empiricist Locke and the Platonist Cudworth than the traditional story allows. Um, so here we have an example of a woman who's, whose philosophy does not receive, does not fit into the received categories, and it's unhelpful to rely on them in order to classify her as a philosopher. To do so required us to reconsider the relationship of her philosophy to both Locke and to Cudworth. It also raises the issue of the relationship of Cudworth to Locke. And this, I think, leads us to have to rethink um, where, where these philosophies, how they, these philosophies have traditionally been perceived. Ultimately, therefore, reintegrating her into the history of philosophy challenges, challenges us to rethink the standard narrative of the history of philosophy. Well, those are some very brief thoughts. I will just uh, finish by saying that this renaissance in women's philosophy has only just begun. Um, and um, there's plenty more work to do uh, for, to discover uh, the philosophers of not just English, England, France, Germany and Italy, but also, as I said before, of Turkey, Ch India, China, Africa, South America. 
Um, so the contextual approach, which has been so productive in restoring women to visibility in philosophy, is I would give to all of this. I think philosophy is sort of different traditions, different cultures. Girls are suspect of view of the history in its entirety, men's as well as women. So recovering the philosophy is a step forward to more general inclusive philosophy, but also in close, close project of uh, inclusive of philosophy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, can, I'm not sure if you can, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear us. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I can to... hear you. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Uh, thanks to both of our speakers. Um, this ends the talks, but not the uh, question answer session. So any questions that uh, may come from the audience will need to be written uh, and, and sent to me. You can send them through chat. Uh, and I will ask them on your behalf um, to our speakers. The, the first question, let's start, comes from uh, Shukri Argun. Uh, now I'll switch to Turkish because the question is in Turkish. Şükrü Argun ilk sorusunu Deniz Altınkaya'ya soruyor. Şükrü Argun is asking to Deniz Altınkaya if philosophy is understood as a lifestyle in the as it was in ancient Greek, what is the general professional? Uh, the philosophy is becoming an occupation, a career. How do you interpret it like? So how do you compare Foucault and Descartes in this perspective? Which one is a more modern philosopher for you? That is the question. Actually, to understand philosophy as related to make it with life itself or transforming itself is again for Foucault, it is a modern approach, as we said. But for the Enlightenment, for example, again, there is a critical uh, thing for uh, having the opportunity for interpreting philosophy like that. Having It is not something going back to ancient Greece, but it creating that, continuing the ethos by modernity or in placing himself in this approach. But of course, Descartes in this context, maybe or from the other hand, is also trying to be a more expert in this sense. Okay, thank you. The second question is uh, again by Shukru Argan, but it's now uh, to Sarah Hutton. Uh, the question is worded in Turkish, so I'll read it in Turkish, but I trust you can uh, hear the, the translation. If not, I can translate the question to you. Soru uh, the question is to you, Sarah. Can we talk about feminine or male uh, perspective of philosophy approach? If, if we can we say that if it is the case to show women can do philosophy too, when women do philosophy, what will philosophy become? What would you like to say about that? Well, there is no doubt that different experience people differently, and it's putting it is true point that men, women, are, uh, from on the uh, we have women often about things which are not getting or some think about well um, more a book than perhaps in the men. Um, and on, I mean, people on um, use particularly um, in the students, and we did a real I mean, uh, discussion about capacities and education. So, those issues are very important. 
um, then don't buy the equivalent in, in temporaries. I think that means philosophy itself is different between the philosophy and from, from, from him. And the that is to very well in the 19th century, then <coughs> much better on case and we're able to pay for the consumer is prominent for the century in in the in the in English actually women single Elizabeth come. Um, so I know that there are I know that there are those who, who argue that uh, differences between men and women think I I I don't see that the evidence of that when you look at, at history. Does that answer your question? Um, now, I'm not sure if the, there's a Wi-Fi problem with my computer or this was uh, a, a general issue. I could hear you only um, in pieces, bits and pieces, and not in, in your entirety. I'm I'm trying to find out if everybody else heard you fine. If so, I'll move on. Uh, if not, uh, I think this is a general um, issue. So I wonder if I could ask you to, uh, with excuses, um, give you a response one more time and see if we can uh, hear it in its entirety. OK. Uh, no problem. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Myself, I don't. If you look at things, look at there is an evidence in on reference subjects, male terms, and it's all true that that flows male or female. But um, the experience. And if it's experience that of men, then it will be reflected in it, they think. But I don't think that men women the philosophy is, is different for men and women. I said the um I, said, I think um good evidence for this is the philosophy twenty. Uh, um, in England, um, what was significant for actually was thinking of Elizabeth Musk, who was acted as a, a philosopher, and um, very much a philosophic base that were going on her time. I don't actually see there being a spiritual philosophy or philosophy. So it, it, the okay, I um, now again, I heard you in bits and pieces, but I don't know if there's anything we can do to help. It might be your Wi Fi connection. Um, uh, I'll try We heard your talk for the most part very well. So this problem started later on. Maybe I will move on with the next question to our other speaker and see if your Wi-Fi issue goes away by itself um, in a couple of minutes. Uh, that would be the easiest solution. Uh, so we can hope for the best. Um, so the next question is to Deniz Altsinkaya. Uh, there is one question to Sarah Hutton that I'm skipping now just to uh, give her Wi-Fi some, some time. This is a question uh, to Deniz Altsinkaya from Kardelen Bozkurt. Şöyle diyor, eski felsefenin erkekler tarafından ele alınması ve kadın... Handling the ancient philosophy by men and making women behind, or that our women philosophers are not taken seriously. So it, it can 
maybe take them out of their desire, as they were called as novelists only. Actually, philosophy is male-dominated. Can we say it like that? Or can they, the area where they can express themselves in the philosophy is occupied by men? So how many, do you, can you cite us some new, some more novelists who are actually philosophers, women novelists. We see men everywhere, and we talk about gender studies. We just have to include the feminist theory, and it only limits feminist philosophy or feminist philosopher as a separate thing. What we can do to overcome this situation? This question is actually asked to Sarah Hutton, I, I think as far as I understood in, as the, from the content of the question. Professor Hatunen, did you hear the translation of the question I just um, uh, expressed? It, I thought it was a question to the other speaker, but it was actually a question to you. Um, and maybe now you cannot hear us. Professor Hutton, can you hear us? Okay, if so, belki o zaman ben Professor Hutton'a yönlendirilen e, soruları e, chatten so, This question was in Turkish. And uh, so maybe our professor our trans interpreters can see it from there so i'm just passing the questions to ask to sarah hatton now a question to deniz altınkaya by mehmet kuyurtar in the other presentations we have been talking about the relationship between the theory and practice. According to the uh, Foucault, theory is a toolbox, you said, for practice. So what is the relationship with the ethic and theoretical reality? Is it a broke, it is a broken way for philosophy? Does it mean about changing the history of thought? Is it a risk, for example? Actually, to think about the past with the uh, talking about the past with the problems or in the context of the current problems yes it is it is a risk but in this area actually the the thing Foucault trying to do is actually to take them uh, to handle them in the historical context it is not actually a distortion actually to put it in this context so that we can understand it. And in his analysis of ancient Greek, for example, we see the examples of it again. But in order to revive, the thing it, it, important is here to revive this critical thinking. We are not going to decide to so find an ultimate solution, but to update an approach is more important in the uh, in our relationship with our with um, history of philosophy, I think it's important in this sense. Another question asked to Sarah Hutton. Can you hear us, Professor Hutton? Cem Kamuzut'un sorduğu bir soruyu... I'm going to write Miss... I'm reading Cem Kamuzut's question to Sarah Hatton. ...prejudice and discrimination and hence fail to have influence on later generations. How are we to approach our works when we find them today? Is your lack of influence on the history of philosophy though no fault of her own, through no fault of her own, of course, justify excluding them from the canon today? That's the question. Uh, we cannot hear you. 
Sorry. No. We cannot hear you. Ee, şimdi Sarah Hatton'a duyamaz olduk. Öyle olduğu zaman e, ben onu... So we cannot hear Sarah. I'm just sending the questions to her by writing, but we cannot hear her. So... Um, we cannot get your answers um, Peki, in the meantime I'll ask another question to our other speaker um, Karun Çekem'in e, Deniz Altınkaya'ya sorusu şöyle Hakikat Karun Çekem is asking a question the thing you have talked about the truth and reality, if we talk about post-truth discussions here, how we can approach to the thinkers who do not accept subjectivity and objective reality as Foucault. So, Foucault is the one who is the relativist or perspectivist. Yes, he's the one who is responsible, but he rejects that the truth is a universal one and it is created throughout the history, he says. But it doesn't make him, actually, we can make an approach to truth we can use from him. And his perspective of the truth gives us the opportunity to real analyze it because he's a relativist. Uh, we cannot keep him aside. He says that. He tells us that uh, this analysis is, tells us that we see that today, for example, in post-truth discussions, when we have a look or how they are defined in our public decisions, our emotions, our, our beliefs are influential when we take a decision rather than an objective phenomena. The field is, we are talking is actually de devaluing the truth, that the truth doesn't exist. They don't say it, but it is devalued. It is humiliated, or it is not internalizing lies. It is not only objecting the truth, but mostly now the relationship between the, uh, the differentiation between the truth and reality is very different now. It's very weak and blurred now. So here, the thing we mostly hear is that there are two polars. There are two poles here. It is a dual framework. While diagnosing this or while talking about that, mind is threatened by emotions, threatened by beliefs or prejudices. And so we still talk about mind and emotions, truth and uh, things and emotions, etc. So Foucault's approach gives us another opportunity to handle the truth in a different way. Of course, we do not uh, keep the truth aside, but in his analysis, Foucault says that the critical being a, the power of truth as being a critical thing is important. So we can ask the question, who, who can tell the truth then? Or we can have a, we just consider, we can just consider the way how the truth exists or how the one telling the truth exists. So we, I just try to think in this context. Is, uh, on the contrary, Foucault's truth perspective gives us the opportunity to understand this issue from these angles without uh, being limited with these dualities, I think. Thank you so much, Professor Hutton. Now, let, let's try again. And we still don't have audio, I think. Understood. We cannot hear Professor Hutton, so I am still passing these questions. Another question asked to Deniz Altınkaya. I think I left it aside. Yamur Sinar is asking. The question is, 
with the relationship about truth and the actors. We have to look for the power. Can we say that the power is fragmented? Is Foucault, is Foucault talking about modernity or defragmenting the, uh, po the power? Or we have to, do we, do we really need to talk about that? The, the power of the modernity is fragmented, fragmented. So how can they ask for truth? Here, actually, in his previous works, there are other points that the powers do not only, he always talks about relations of within the power. Yes, but it's about funding the actor here, the agent here is important. So in his late works, he gives us the opportunity to create new agencies, new agents within the framework of power and ethics. So we cannot keep them aside. We have to think about them all together, all three, all together, power and the others. They are not separated from each other. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we cannot hear you. Uh, if we cannot hear you, um, I will, however, uh, read an answer that Professor Hutton uh, wrote um, and sent me in writing. She says, in reply to the question, influence isn't the issue, lack of influence, uh, this might be an answer to uh, uh, Jem Kamazut's uh, uh, question. Lack of influence is not a reason for excluding women from the history of philosophy to approach a forgotten philosopher, a forgotten philosopher's works, we need to find about her historical circumstances. What were the traditions of philosophizing in her time and what were the issues? This is what I mean to be adopting um, a contextual approach. Um, okay, I think with this, I will close the session. Let me just say in relation to all the discussions here, especially Professor Hutton's um, um, presentation. I Part of my work is in philosophy, but part of it is in cognitive science, and I have reviewed the literature on gender differences uh, quite extensively. There's a lot of work on it. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever um, that women are cognitively inferior in any area to men. Um, so people who keep uh, repeating uh, that men are better and women cannot do this or that are um, simply repeating um, baseless cliches and there is no truth to what they say because this is an issue that um, a lot of people in cultural anthropology, in social psychology, in neuroscience do actively look at and, and try to uh, empirically test. Um, because the Turkish söyleyeyim, kapatıyorum artık. He's repeating the same point in Turkish too. I am closing this session. I am both working on the philosophy of mind and the cognitive sciences. Is there a cognitive differences between men and women? There is a great body of knowledge. And I am doing my best to follow this. There is not recording in progress. Single evidence Recording about stopped. that women are inferior to men cognitively. Especially in our country, there are some cliches being uh, repeated, women can do this and can do that, but this is not right. But since 20 years, I am teaching in universities, I had hundreds of students, but I have never seen that men are superior to women. It's not about nature, it's not about birth. Um, 
I am speaking about the mental area, mental faculties. If someone is telling this, these are unfounded, don't believe in them, open the scientific literature and read it, because neuroscientists, socio psychologists and anthropologists are quite keen on this issue, and they have uh, followed this issue, and they have made empirical studies. They have looked at this. What does the cognitive area say? We have to look at this. And having said this, I'd like to thank two speakers, Denis Altenkaya and Sarah Atten. Thank you very much. This was the last session of today. This is the end. But this is not the end of the first international symposium of philosophy organized by Ege University. Peter Adamson will be chairing tomorrow's uh, sessions. I'm also listening to Peter Adamson's uh, series. Thank you very much. Okay. De, hem konuşmacılara right. hem de size çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Maalesef e, aksaklıklar oldu. Umarım e, sorry for some problems. We hope we will be hosting uh, Ms. Hatun again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Yes. Professor okay. Hatton for your great speech. Thank you for joining. Thank us. you very much. Okay. Thank you. And, and now uh, we are ending this session. Peki. Hoşça kalın. Hoşça kalın. Okay. Evet. Bye. Tamamdır. And of course our translators. Thank you very much. Thanks to your uh, chairing the session. Uh, we had uh, keep uh, this session together. Thank you very much. I uh, thank you, and I hope the symposium will be repeated in the upcoming years. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Now ending the session. Bu oturumu kapatıyoruz. Ha, kapatmadan önce. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much.